Hey folks, John here from AS for Alcoholic again. Today's conversation is with Lauren from Brutal Recovery, a meme page on Instagram that does sobriety recovery memes. It can be extraordinarily dark sometimes, it can be extraordinarily heavy sometimes, but it's always hilarious. So we talked about some of that uh, heavy and dark stuff. We talked about drinking and recovery and finding community and the beautiful language of memes in recovery, how they work and, uh, and how we relate to them in a very, very specific way. Um, or how there's this feeling that we are the only ones that have this experience, this very singular solitary experience in recovery and in sobriety and come to find out there's a lot of us. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Lauren from Brutal Recovery. Lauren, thank you so much for doing this. Oh, um, thanks for having me. It's uh, it's an interesting, well, the internet is kind of an interesting place uh, to say the least. <laughs> and um, it's where I find a lot of my guests and um you have a very and you know, a very unique uh maybe not so unique since a lot of people relate to it but an interesting perspective and i've never i've never talked to somebody who is the admin of a meme page before <gasps> <laughs> oh my god the madness behind the meme page yes, yes. um so and i do i do want to talk a little bit i do want to get to that later um mm -hmm. and uh and for those who who don't know to tell us the meme page really quickly yeah i i have uh, i started the page brutal recovery in two oh god i think i started it in 2018 mm -hmm. so i think it's like it's gonna be four this year it's four years uh yeah so late 2018 so brutal recovery brutal recovery um yeah so so before we get into memes and 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 how they they help us in recovery um <laughs> When did you first, uh, when did alcohol first come into your life? How do you remember alcohol? Oh man. Now? So, um, as you can probably tell from my accent, I am from Scotland, uh, which I'm sure everyone has their own associations <laughs> with that, you know? So, you know, I was not immune to being around a lot of like the Celtic blood disease, as we call it, like <sighs> alcohol was very much, um, in the, in the you know orbital growing up and uh you know my my dad he he my, my dad gave me a first drink kind of because he knew that we were going to come across it like it's like if even my i'm from a really really small town one of the small towns were like the only things to do when you're a young person is like drink and get pregnant so like he kind of wanted us to be like okay you're gonna come across this like we want you to experience it like in the house safe so I was probably I was probably about maybe 12 13 at about that age um so he gave me and my sister a drink and my sister is not an alcoholic so she took the drink and was like wow that's disgusting I'm a child I'm gonna go climb a tree now um <laughs> I kind of knew from that moment that I was like oh shit like this is gonna this this is the answer to my life like yeah every, like all of that like weird otherness like just kind of like disappeared and um yeah but like I, I was this like weird loner kid like had the hold of I had all of these like macabre interests and I was in I was a musician so like I was like I didn't have many social skills I think so you know I went out at first, like in the early days, like drinking, I was like, it was one of the only things I did that was in air quotes normal for a young person. But I kind of escalated like very quickly into not normal, like uh, very, very quickly. My my drinking became, you know, more of the necessity. And even my friends that like, you know, because we we went hard in Scotland, we go really hard, really young. Um, and I was always the one that went like that little bit harder, you know, so it was it was picked up quite early. So by about the time that I was uh, about 16, that was when I kind of outdrank the drinking culture, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, high school is the is the place for experimentation. The high school is the place for um, seeing how far you can push things and not just, you know, right. like with teachers and parents, but 
I remember the same exact thing, going to house parties or being drunk at at people's houses, not even parties. That's that's being yeah. generous, calling them a party. <laughs> um, but just seeing how much we could drink or how strong it could be and what kind mm. of trouble we could get into and what sort of what sort of horrible delinquency we could get away with, <laughs> you know? Absolutely. Um, did you find that you you came into any sort of consequences at that point or was it still just kind of fun? You know, um, I always thought that I didn't have any consequences, but when I look over and I realize this, that the cons- I realize now that the consequences were my dignity and my safety. Um, but because like I didn't really value that, like I didn't see it as a consequence. So like I got into lots of consequences, like um, one in particular that comes to my head is like I one of the first times I got drunk, I was about 14, like blackout drunk. Um, it was at a house party. And I remember my mom gave me like a quart of vodka. She was like, this is to share. And like, I remember like going to the kitchen and just like down again, like, like sharing. Ha, that's cute. Um, and I remember like I woke up uh, on the bathroom floor and I was next to this guy and he had like his shirt off and I woke up and I was kind of like oh my god like what happened like did we sleep together like what happened and he was like no you were sick on me all night so those were like the kind of you know earlier consequences and I'm like oh that wasn't a lot but like you know when I think back I'm like that was quite humiliating like um to think about and then obviously like as a, as a young woman uh, I was very low self-esteem there was lots of you know kind of the consequences of uh consent being crossed and all of that did not realize that was a trauma until I got sober that was a fun realization um but I'm I'm quite lucky I've had no uh legal consequences like I was never lifted I, like I'm a you know I'm, I'm very I'm very I've got a lot of you know privilege in that area uh so I didn't have any legal consequences but it, it started to become not fun very quickly but I was like clinging so hard to like that magical time that it would work again you know yeah. <laughs> like yeah. and I, it just got more embarrassing and more humiliating and more dangerous you know yeah um, you so you've mentioned twice now that both your both your parents, your father and your mother, gave you alcohol at at a certain point to drink. Now, was that was alcoholism something that you recognized ran in the family? Were they just more liberal about it because they knew it was prevalent? Yeah, I, I think that they. Um, it, it just kind of was the reality, you know. Yeah. Um, and I, I didn't really know. Um, I, I did. I asked my mom. Uh, you know what is an alcoholic very young uh because the the word was in the language you know um and she said an alcoholic is someone that drinks alone and I was like oh okay makes sense but you know when your whole family is drinking you know you're right. not drinking alone right. um and yeah I feel like in Scottish culture as well like and I think this is in every culture you know I, I got sober in America and I thought that I couldn't possibly get sober because I was from Scotland and then I went to America and I was like oh we're actually all exactly the same okay um I think in every culture like we have like the designated alcoholic you know if they're a park bench drinker they're an alcoholic right. if they drink out of a brown paper bag they're an alcoholic if they're um you know there's and and like in our culture it was kind of like um we 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 had that example that like there was this one there was this one guy in my hometown uh and we're like oh he's he's the hometown alcoholic so we're all fine we're all doing we're all great so um so yeah but and as as far as like you know it it just, it just kind of was the reality like to the I never had to be peer pressured because like I loved alcohol from the very, very, very start. But if someone wasn't drinking, like that was an extremely abnormal thing kind of in, in Scottish culture. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that's very similar here. I mean, if you watch, if you watch American television for any amount of time, yeah, commercials, I mean, it, or whatever it is streaming, it doesn't matter. Like the, the commercials and the advertisements are heavily, swayed toward alcohol and drinking right. and having a good time and the the tiniest little font is or the you know the the lettering is you know drink responsibly and mm-hmm. that's the that's that's never the case I've, and i i mean 
I've never wanted to drink responsibly, even to this day when it will cross my mind. It's like, yeah. how much can I get away with? Could I, if I drink, could I mm. drink, you know, like how much could I drink? Yeah, I totally, totally relate to that. Like I, um, you know, I, I rarely think about drinking anymore. It, do, it doesn't really cross my mind, but like any time that I feel like that, like, God, I really fucking wish I could drink right now. It's not because I want to enjoy myself. It's because I either want to, you know, blast my head off my shoulders or just like, you know, it's, you know, if, for me, like getting sober is the best thing I've ever done because I've got this big, beautiful glitter in life, Um, you know, lots of lovely stuff that's sometimes so overwhelming so sometimes I'm like god I wish I could be drunk right now it's not because I want to enjoy my life it's because my life is overwhelming me you know right so, right I've like come to this realization that that those moments of um I really want to drink is mostly I really want relief from whatever yeah. the thing is at the moment right when I'm saying like I want a drink I'm not saying I want a drink I'm saying I'm in pain you know, yeah. that's, that's what, that's my kind of like translation. Yeah. And yeah, totally. And that was my whole child. That was like my entire, my entire drinking career. Like it was just me saying like, I'm in pain. Why is no one noticing that I'm in so mm -hmm. much pain, but at the same time, she got to like upkeep the illusion and the delusion, you know, you got to pretend that you're having like the time of your life, you know? Right. And I mean, were there, were there good times or was it all you know, I, yeah, I, there, there were some good times, you know, I think that uh, I am a very, very black and white person. Um, and, but I, I do think that like looking at, you know, my sobriety is black and white. Right. So I can't say that when I was drinking, I was bad. And now that I'm sober, I'm good. Um, or I can't say that everything was terrible when I was drinking and everything's great now largely that is true apart from the fact that like, I was not bad when I was drinking I was a lost hurt person that made lots of mistakes that she had two figs um but I was not a bad person um I did show things so. um but like the, yeah there were good times and I think that it's kind of okay to say that like the yeah. there were there were times that you know the the alcohol doesn't work for me but there were times where like I it never was as good as the first time it never was as good like when I discovered it and thought like oh thank god like this is this is it um but yeah you know the and it's 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 quite I remember like first getting sober like there was a couple of those times that, like wait but what about that time that I was out and I only drank one bottle of wine and then I kissed that boy that I really liked and then I went home and had a like old-fashioned like I must be a normal drinker because like I, I had a good time then <laughs> like yeah so I just like to I like to ask that and I I'm always curious because I got called out on it once by a friend really? because I would I would get on this microphone and and I would start pontificating about this that and the other and and he was like come on John we had some good times like and he's sober mm. now too and so oh, I nice. was like you know what you're you're right you're right I don't mean to because it's very easy for me to say it was all bad and I yeah. was self-destructive. And like you said, I was hurt and I was lost and I was just trying to find my way through life like anybody else. I just mm -hmm. had this whole layer of, of drunkenness on top of it. Totally. But there were some good times. And so it's like, it, it's, I think it, I think that it's important to say that so that it doesn't sound like sobriety didn't fix everything I guess is, is my yeah. main point a hundred percent yeah I you know one one of the times where you know I, I was with my best friend in the world and we we used to do this thing where we would get a one-way ticket to a city in continental Europe and then we would get like buses around like continental Europe just like you know fanning about the, con the, the continent and then we'd get home eventually um and I was still drinking then. And, you know, we had this like really, really beautiful time. Like it was incredible. And like, it went like out and like, you know, all, all, all of the things. And um, that, you know, reflecting on that, I'm like, you know what I, I had, and he's sober now too as well, which is funny enough. And like, I do, I do think about that and I'm kind of like, oh my God, like it's, it's challenging to think of like the, the, the drinking being fun but like when I when I really boil it down it's like well it was it was connecting with my best friend in the world that was fun it was connecting yeah. with um you know going to cathedrals and going like 
and engage it like going on an adventure and like that sense of stuff and that was kind of the promise that I thought alcohol was giving me I thought alcohol was giving me the sense of fun and adventure and connection but when I boiled it down it was like no it's the friend that I was there with when I when I you know I, th- I think about the late late stages of my drinking and like I, I was like a like <laughs> I was a vodka drinker I was a morning drinker like I you know I was just like a built for purpose like suicide drinker like in the end and it's easy for me to like lump it under that like that was my whole drinking career but it wasn't and I needed to drink every single drop of alcohol that I needed to to get to that point and like thank god I got to that point where I was desperate enough to like make this change but like you're so right like sobriety does not fix everything because and at first like it made things worse like and I want that's why I want to show with my page like at first everything got worse because I didn't have the thing that I had to deal with life I didn't mess my whole life up so yeah yeah. So, so when, so in high school you were drinking, how long through and after high school before you were ready to stop? Oh, I got, well, I, I got sober when I was, I, I got sober like this time around when I was 25, but I first gave uh, sobriety a, a proper whack when I was 19. Um, it had an enormous consequence. Uh, I was in Italy with some friends. We were doing, I'm, I'm a classical singer, I sing opera and, you know, I'd had this amazing opportunity to go to Italy. I was singing for a princess, like it was somebody's 21st birthday and um, I got so drunk like that I disappeared with a bunch of Italian men down an alleyway like may or may not have taken a mystery pill and ended up like catatonic like roaming the streets of Italy jeopardizing the tour like worrying my friends just all, like it was a disaster I broke the toilet in like a villa like it was <laughs> it was not pretty so that kind of like you know scared me sober for for a while it didn't stick for it didn't stick for very long uh probably about eight months or so which I guess is quite a long time like when I was like doing it alone and I was doing it, you know, out of fear. And uh, so that, that was like, I knew that I needed to get sober at that point. Um, but then I relapsed when I was about 20 and things got worse. Things got a lot worse. And then I just moved country. So I was like, do you know what? Scotland's the problem, like the classic geographical cure, you know? So I moved to America when I was about 21, 22, um, because I thought it would fix my life. Uh, And you guessed it, things got worse. And (laughs) then, yeah, so then I, I, I got sober for for this time around when I was 25 and it was it was just like the I, I hear lots of people say this like I, I heard the voice like I heard the voice mm-hmm. inside that said like you know you're done like th- I was being offered help and I'd been offered help so many times before like so many people had tried to you know get me get me to not even stay sober like get me to just like stop like sit down and stop like hurtling at the walls and um so many people had wanted to help uh but I was being offered help and I think I kind of knew that it was my last chance or one of the I I don't want to think like that but like I was just done like and the voice within said like take that help like please like what would happen if you wanted to live and yeah like I I get chills every time I think of that moment because like I still can put myself in it so clearly and and hearing that voice and like feeling that voice and just I'd, I'd never heard that before. I'd never felt that before. It's interesting. Okay. You you say you're. Uh, go ahead. No, no, no. <laughs> well, I was going to say. I'm just. I'm. I'm. You're saying you're. You. You tell me you're a singer and you heard a voice. Mm. And for me, I'm. You know, I'm much more visual as far as. Mm. Um. You know, as far as a. I know this is a podcast, but for me, photography and and video mm. and stuff like that. And when my moment came, like I saw these flashes, I saw these things disappearing in front of me, like my car, my house, my job, like I just saw myself without them. And so it's just Mm -hmm. interesting to me that you say I heard a voice. And that voice is something I don't know if there's a connection there. But that's just what I heard just now. So interesting. But my my very similar moment of being done. Um, Yeah. And so so the voice says, this is it, Lauren, please mm-hmm. take the help. Yeah. 
And what did that help look like? How did you find that? Or what was that process like? So I had had another consequence. Uh, I was I was in a show and I I'd kind of messed up. Like I, I hadn't learned the role very well. I was showing up to rehearsals kind of disorderly. Uh, I, I was being a terrible castmate. Like I was being so horrible, uh, really disrespectful. And the director like pulled me up on it, and he was like, "You you gotta like sort it out." And the conductor was like, "Oh my god!" The conductor was like, "If if you don't follow me, you're gonna ruin this whole show." Um, and what happened was like it kind of scared me. Like scared me sober again. Um, but like I. I was physically dependent upon alcohol. So like I went into a really, really hard withdrawal in the tech week because uh, I quit cold turkey and I didn't think that it was that bad that I needed like a medical detox, but I did. Um, so I messed up the, the, the dress rehearsal and it caught the attention of, you know, there was an addiction counsellor at my at my university and there was my my head of year and like a kind of another like counsellor. And I'd kind of been in touch with them before, but I had been in touch with them for my anxiety because it was my anxiety that was the problem. <laughs> like, And they were kind of like, how much are you drinking? And I'd be like, you don't get it. It's my anxiety. So they, they, you know, they'd got the news of this and uh, I thought that I was going to get kicked out. I thought it was, this was in my graduate program and I, I, I genuinely thought that I was going to get kicked out because I'd, you know, they'd, they'd chosen me and uh, I had not fulfilled the brief. I'd not fulfilled the promises. I was supposed to be a professional, uh, respectful classmate and cast member. I was neither. So I was like, great, they're good. They're going to throw me out. So I can like, I've got this brilliant excuse to kill myself. Cause that was all I wanted to do at that point in my life. Um, yeah. And, and then that's, that's when they said like, we're, we're going to get you help. Uh, what that looked like for me, I couldn't go to, um, I didn't have the money for rehab, <laughs> even though I got sober in Connecticut and like the rehabs there are amazing. Uh, I couldn't afford them. So uh, I was involved in, uh, I was put into DBT groups. Uh, I was put into like an IOP. A what, a what group? A DBT group. It's like, uh, it's, it's like a skills group. It's like a type of therapy, which is like teaches you the skills of how to deal with life. <laughs> um, okay. And I'm a 12 stepper as well. So I got um I got into the the middle of the bed in a 12 step program. So I was lovingly encouraged. Um and I was I, you know, I was really I was willing, but I was so, so scared. So like um I really, really had to reach that desperation point. Um yeah, and and you know, drag myself to all of these things. And I knew I knew that my life depended on it, and I knew that my visa depended on it. And my like university depended on it um so uh, yeah that was I was I was really well resourced um and I was really well taken I was really well taken care of and like I realized that you know the more you get into these uh, recovery communities and recovery spaces like you start to realize people care about you and not everyone wants you to die and not everyone thinks that you're as shit as you think you are like so it was it was amazing <laughs> yeah yeah I mean it's 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 very, very true. They don't, a lot of times they don't care at all, right? <laughs> right? Like it's, it's all in your head about how much you think they think you're a piece of shit. And Incredible. then they come find out that either they really do care about you and want to see you do well, or they're in their own head thinking the same thing. I know. You know? It's so freeing. It's so freeing. Right. Right. And it's, I think there's a, that like that switch of I don't want to say I don't give a shit, but like there's a certain switch of like confidence that comes in that when you go, oh, wait, I've spent all this time worrying about what mm. all these other people think about me. And then to come realize they're not thinking about me at all. Totally. It's like, oh, OK, well, let's move on then. Mm -hmm. um, and then so you said you were willing, but you were scared. And yeah. whereas I was extraordinarily skeptical and wanted to be investigative. I was Ooh. like, I'll do this. It's not going to work, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. But I'm going to, I'll I'll get to the bottom of why it's not going to work. And in that process, it ended up working. Um, <laughs> but when you, how do you get through that fear uh, in the beginning, even if you are willing, mm -hmm. or how did you? 
I think, you know, a lot of it came from just be like, I couldn't feel hope. Like I had not known what hope had felt like for a very long time, but I could feel curious. Um, and when I thought about it, I was like, okay, I'm scared of being alive, but I'm also scared of dying. I'm scared that literally everybody hates me. Um, I'm scared that there's nothing on the other side, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, well, worst comes to worst, you don't want to be alive anyway. So like, why don't you just be curious and mm. like see what might happen? Um, yeah. And I needed, you know, there, there was just so many things that I'd never done before. I'd never processed a human emotion naturally. I'd never um, even, like, I'd never, I remember the first time I ordered a cup of coffee. And, like, obviously I'd ordered cups of coffee before, but, like, for some reason, like, being totally mentally present for ordering a cup of coffee, having a conversation with another human being, like, saying, like, hi, my name's Lauren, like, what's yours and like just learning how to communicate with other people like that was terrifying to me um and there's there's a little bit inside me like this is where I'm gonna like I'm, I'm a Scottish woman like I am not afraid of <laughs> like I'm I love to like get in the whole like you know Scottish people are brave and like we're fighters and like we never give up um so I kind of like had to call them like this is gonna sound so like hyperbolic but I'm a very dramatic person, I'm an opera singer. I was like, just call on the ancestors. Like, if they can fight tooth and nail against English oppression, you can go to a church basement and say your name. Like, you know, sort of thing. Right, so... yeah. <laughs> that's like, you can be brave if that's all you need to do, right? Yeah. If that's the first step. Absolutely. And like, it's, I had to keep it so, so simple because, you know, even though I was like a personal disaster and a human liability I'd always excelled academically I had always like I, I'd done like on paper my career actually looks quite good mm -hmm. I, I was very used to being good at things straight away and not being good at being sober was really humbling <laughs> at first <laughs> And, and, you know, having to face up to the fact that, like, wow, I can't have a conflict with anyone without leaving the country was really humbling. And I don't know how to do my taxes. Like, that's humbling. I know how to do my taxes. Now. That's the gift of sobriety. <laughs> uh, but, like, yeah, just, like, keeping it so simple. Like, this is all I have to do. And just, it, it's it's so cliche, but, like, next right thing. Like, it's so, so relevant. Well, yeah, and I've talked to people who uh, will say, well, you know, I've been sober for X amount of time and I really need to quit smoking or I need to eat better or I need to exercise. And so I'm going to do this, 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 and this. And there's two things I hear a lot. They're like, I hear people say, don't do too much at once. Mm. And I don't think that that's bad advice. And I don't, it depends on the person. Mm. Uh, but the person I was talking to, I said, Hey, you know what? It sounds like you're really excited today to do all of these things. Why don't you go ahead and do them? Just know that when most of them don't work out, like go feel what it feels like to be somebody who, who eats good, who exercises and who doesn't smoke today. And then mm. when that falters in three days and you're back to smoking another cigarette or eating another donut or whatever it is. Maybe you don't, mm -hmm. maybe you turn it all around today, but then at least you know what it feels like for a day and, yeah. and then sort of sort out what you're good at in quitting mm -hmm. and then focus on that. But yeah. most people, I mean, myself included, one thing at a time, right? Right. I am totally of the fuck around and find out school. So like, if you have to, like, I, I've totally done that before, like set myself the highest of expectations mm -hmm. and you know time and time again find like oh okay that didn't quite work maybe I'll set myself just high expectations you know yeah. and there's also something to be said for like right you know living you know one day at a time also means like 
riding your energy wave that you have on that particular day like the energy I have on any given day whether it's mental energy spiritual energy physical energy like that's going to be very different on any given day and um you know the the next right thing on a day when my energy is really really high might be many different things at a time but like I was I was sick on Tuesday and I literally was was a slug all day and it was actually kind of amazing which was like my worst nightmare it's like productivity is really important to me um I you know but, but it was actually kind of amazing to like have a day off to be unwell um and that like that was the right thing and I was I had a weird relationship with it because like some there's a little perverse part of me that kind of sometimes wishes that I could be hung over again because like when mm. like that feeling of just like stewing and like having really shitty petrol uh, gas station coffee like half of the pizza from the night before I don't have to do anything covers over the heads like I don't mm. exist I don't exist um like part of me really 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 misses that and then I had this like little realization I don't need to be hung over to do that like I can be sleepy yeah. and rest and yeah. do those things and it's not a bad thing no. I can like it's incredible so that's my revelation this week it's absolutely extraordinary that's awesome yeah I know that I I do and I think those of us who are who are artists and those of us who create and those of us who share it with other people um, often will have these, these self-imposed um, uh, expectations of productivity mm -hmm. and things have to happen at a certain time. And if they don't have it happen at a certain time, then people won't be there to see it. And if they're not there to see it, then I don't mm -hmm. exist. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, Oh my God, I got to keep going, keep going, keep going. And the other yeah. night, and I haven't, I haven't done this for a while, but I, I got a new video game and I played video games for like, I don't know. It was like, I mean, not long, like an hour and a half, two hours, but like well, for me, nothing. that's <laughs> right. That's nothing in the gaming world. Right. Um, but I was like, oh, this is great. I don't, I just didn't care about anything else. So I think that, yes, mm -hmm. you can do that. You can hibernate, you can order pizza. You can even drink <laughs> bad gas station coffee. If you want, you don't have to be in this spiritual physical deficit to enjoy it yeah totally absolutely that's such a good way of putting it yeah you know um so you get sober at you said 25 now what year yeah was 25 that? Yeah. that was 2018 so i got sober in the march um and i started the brutal recovery in december so <laughs> okay so so you 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 got sober in march it took you nine nine months to get to recovery and 12 step and all that. Yeah. Yeah. So um because I had a similar situation. So I'm wondering like what what are those nine months like? Are you by yourself? Who are you talking to? What do you what do you tell your old friends? Are you making any new <laughs> friends? Who are you talking to? Um I was very secretive about my sobriety at first I um yeah I, I was really really secretive because I thought that I was handing in my culture card like I thought that I wasn't Scottish anymore um I thought that people wouldn't like me I I had a boyfriend at the time I made him my higher power um I <laughs> could admit that now I did not admit that for a very long time but um he he was definitely my higher power for a long time and uh yeah I really I had varying levels of acceptance for about the first nine months because part of me felt really 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 burnt up about the fact that I got sober at 19 for like nine months like I, I could have um stayed sober like why yeah. didn't I just the, why did I have to burn up my life for six more years like why yeah. did I why did I do that like um so so part of me was like really really ashamed like anyone anyone that I told like oh I'm, I'm actually in recovery right now like they um 
would con- like say like oh wow that's really good that's really brave and I just be like no it's not like what are you talking about <laughs> like, you know I was I was really angry and um I was really kind of just disappointed in myself and like uh dreaming of an alternate universe mm-hmm. of like where my journey wasn't my journey and I think that's so so I was very secretive and I told I didn't I would go out with people still and I would like order like an ice a root beer float and stuff like that and just be like oh it's fine and I'd have lots of excuses like oh I'm just taking care of my voice right now I'm an antibiotics right now like you know just just all of that stuff and um the more that I accepted that that I was an alcoholic and the more that I accepted that um it actually was a great and good thing that I was sober um that kind of evened out and yeah yeah, it's just it's so it's it's like you were saying earlier like I feel like with my my friends now maybe it's because I think about it less that like people really don't care that I'm sober anymore and people never cared in the first place like I tell this story all the time of like one of my friends from Scotland was coming over to America and she I was like got to tell her that I'm sober because she's coming all this way and she's gonna be so disappointed that I'm not gonna drink with her and and I said to her like listen I don't drink anymore um it's been a wee while like and I'm I'm sorry like and if you don't want to hang out with me that's okay and she said to me oh thank god that you were a nightmare when you drank yes <laughs> so, it's like really she was like yeah you were awful <laughs> And like that, that I I did that was not the only time I had that experience. Like yeah. um I was I was talking with another friend and he said like we're talking about like, you know, keeping in the day and blah 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 and you know the what it what it means to be an alcoholic and he was just kind of like you know, he's like, I don't care what you call yourself, Lauren, but I just hope to God that you never drink another drop of alcohol as long as you live. <laughs> it's like, that's so kind. <laughs> that's yeah. so nice. And you just, because we're so absolutely blind to it in the midst of it all, right? <laughs> you think, yeah, we're just having fun. And people are like, oh God, there were, I remember parties that I would have at my house where I would invite all these people over and we're having fun and good times. Mm-hmm. And then in the blink of an eye, I wake up on the living room floor alone. Yeah. Like 11 o'clock at night. And I'm like, where did everybody (laughs) go? There were like 30 people in here. And God Mm -hmm. knows what I did to drive them all away. But I was the only one left there on the floor. Right. Oh, geez. So. Totally. And like there there were like, you know, and keep it realistic. Like there were friends that I lost. Like there there were friends that were kind of like, oh, you're not fun anymore. But I they (laughs) they're not having any fun. Like yeah. they, you know, they they had to. Some of them had to protect their own drinking, and like they, some of them are sober now and we're friends now. Some mm. of them are still out there, and I, you know, we don't really have a friendship, and like that's okay because like you're allowed to grow out of friendships. Like, I, it doesn't make me worse than them or better than them. It just means that we, our paths don't cross anymore, um, and that's okay. Um, but I'm I'm often found now that like. It's so funny because I feel like, you know, the whole like, you know, because I'm there's I don't drink, which is fine. I don't drink. You can get past that. Like if someone says like, oh, why aren't you drinking? I can say like, oh, it doesn't mix well with me. Um, or, you know, like, oh, I've, I've had enough. <laughs> like That sort of thing. And then there's like, I'm sober. It's like, that's a little bit more of an identifier. Like, ooh, she's a sober lady. What does that mean? And then it's like, I'm in recovery, which is like, there's a reason why I'm sober. Right. And I kind of like, whenever I'm like getting to know people, I kind of go through that three part like, thing. And I've, I've had an experience yeah. recently. I've, I've started dating someone and he's not sober. And uh, I, when I, when I finally got to phase three where, you know, I was like, this, this was quite a little while in and I was kind of like, listen, I, I am in recovery because I'm, uh, you know, have a bit of a gnarly past with the, with the stuff and the things. And I'll be like, you know, and I'm like, I still don't mind if you drink, like, and he's allergic to peanuts. So I was kind of like, it's like peanuts now. Like you don't eat peanuts cause they will kill you. I don't drink, like I don't year, you don't year after peanuts. I don't year after alcohol. It's just something I can't have near me. Um, and he was like, oh, cool. 
And like he wasn't even shocked. I like part of me was like really relieved because like it, did, it didn't have the whole like, oh, you're a bird with a broken wing and I must take care of you forever. And it wasn't like, oh, you're a bad person and I don't want to be with you. But like part of me wanted like a little bit of scandalized, you know, part of me wanted like a tiny bit of a reaction. No do reaction. You, do you think as alcoholics, we're a little prone to the melodramatic or is that <laughs> being the artist as well? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I part of me thinks that that is just my temperament, and that's okay. Um, I'm very like I love a narrative. Like famously, mm -hmm. alcoholics love a narrative. Mm -hmm. So you know, right. like, yeah, it's it's really really funny. Like um, I'm I'm very drawn to the the melodrama, and it's so funny because like the melodrama is never real, and like I have like about. Oof, six or seven very dramatic stories of my drinking and the rest of them are all very ordinary and sad um and that's just kind of the reality of alcoholism isn't it like yeah there's not I mean it's like yeah I just usually kept the bottle of vodka under my bed and you know mm -hmm. would pull it out when I needed a nip and that was most mornings and so <laughs> near the end but that was, that you know, was that's nothing that's just sad right but that's the it's truth just... <laughs> um so let's talk a little bit about melodrama, real and imagined, and how <laughs> one begins to create a meme page around sobriety, around um, the very real problems that we have, but also often the very imagined problems that we create for ourselves. Oh my God, How did yeah. this come about? How do you, how does, I don't even know, how does one create a meme so page? I remember uh, I was so I was in about nine months sober. Uh, things, you know, get a little bit better. I think it's all right. Um, but I wasn't relating to a lot of people's experiences. I wasn't really, I didn't relate to like the sober, like yoga, green juice, inspirational quote sober. I, I didn't get that. Like, I was just like, that's, that 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 is a world away from me and I the, I didn't relate to I didn't yet I, I now can say with my whole chest that like getting sober was the best thing I've ever done like um at the time though I've, I've kind of felt resentful because I was kind of like why don't you see how much pain I'm in like how could this be the best thing you've ever done I'm in agony and I don't know how to do my taxes <laughs> like it was you know so I kind of wanted um, to, at first I thought like this was going to kind of just be a diary. I kind of, I first thought that it was just going to kind of be like where I was going to get out all of my very unspiritual thoughts about people that I was annoyed at, <laughs> like, who thought that it was great. And like, I loved, um, I also loved like all of the contradictions of being sober. Like, it's so funny that we're like, how the, the I mean the very fact that we are sober is a contradiction like it's hilarious that we have this like enormous urge to like destroy everything but we're choosing to live sober like it's it's amazing to me that we're like so capable and smart and creative we're so fucking stupid sometimes and I love that about us I love that about me um yeah, and I love that we can be so emotionally articulate and so emotionally stunted at the same time. <laughs> like, so I, I wanted a place to kind of process that creatively. Um, I'd followed lots of like mental health meme accounts um, and I followed one sober meme account. I followed uh, Fucking Sober. He's uh, been, uh, he's been memeing for a lot uh, longer than I have. And he's also now a very dear friend, uh, shout out to Fucking Sober he's the best and um yeah I kind of just like thought like you know I I could do this like this is where I could put like my angry thoughts my angry sort of um feelings and also like I wanted to laugh like sometimes yeah. you know knowing that like I am a life or death sober person like if if I drink, it will first take my sanity, and if it takes my sanity, it will take my life. Like it's it's no fucking joke that I stay sober. Um, that's a lot to carry without having a laugh every now and then. So like I needed to laugh, like I needed to kind of like throw my hands in the air and say like, 
this is hilarious yeah. um so so I kind of just like I started the page and I threw up like a couple of memes and it got like a little bit of traction um and then I, I just kept doing it like quite consistently and uh yeah just all of the stuff that I thought was things that I just thought actually turned out to be extraordinarily common you like and and then like more it's really funny because like when I got started like there was one there was fucking sober um and dank recovery memes and mm -hmm. there was like a couple a couple of other meme accounts so like I was maybe one of like five or six in the start um and one of the things that I love so much is how like recovery meme culture has exploded like there's so many accounts now like it's such a it's it's such an enormous thing and it's such a beautiful language that we have like I think that it's really really helping people to like succinctly see the the hilarious side and also like help people that are like just getting sober like me in the start that like you know this is something you will laugh at one day like this is yeah. this feels like the worst thing in the world right now but like one day you're gonna look back on this laugh and help someone else with it yeah and it's there's these things that happen in our own lives in our own heads in our own rooms like by ourselves in the most quiet secret dark corners of our minds mm -hmm. where we're not sharing these experiences or thoughts or feelings with anyone else mm -hmm. and i have found that through the memes of sobriety <laughs> i'm like oh shit i was there the other night i thought that yeah. exact same thing i didn't share it with anybody i went on with my day you know but i was just like i wonder about this or this is how i felt and so i think that is such a relief to know mm. that those weird things that I think and feel mm -hmm. are not that weird. They're not that weird at all. Not that it's weird. amazing. I'm I'm far more boring and common than <laughs> than I would like to be, right? But that's that's the relief, and that's mm -hmm. the connection, right? And that's the the mm -hmm. um yeah the relief and the connection that I'm looking for with other people, and you know maybe. Totally. And you talk about it being a beautiful language. And I think you're talking about the meme, which is kind of like, um, for lack of a better word, it's like a, it's like a comic for people who don't draw. Right. I mean, it's, Ooh, uh, nice. Yeah. And that's how I heard it described once, you know, maybe disparagingly, but I think that it's, it's its own unique thing now, certainly in the last yeah. five, seven years, something like that, since it has mm -hmm. become huge, it's yeah. become a way that we communicate right it really has like it's it, it honestly has like but because it's so quick and it's so simple and it can contain so many things and uh my favorite thing that i see on the page is like people that comment just the handles of their friends like underneath it because they know that like it's something that's going to make their friend laugh because mm -hmm. like I do that like I like I'm sending memes to my friends all day every day I'm making friends like memes for my friends like all mm -hmm. day every day like I've literally asked people out by making them a meme like it's just like it's so um it is like a cultural language and uh yeah it's I honestly was I was thinking about this a couple of days ago that like you know in 10 years time when you know time has moved on maybe instagram's not a thing anymore maybe memes aren't a thing anymore i dread to think the day i don't think it's going to happen but i just like I, i'm going to look back and just think wow in my late 20s i i was a memer <laughs> like that was my job yeah because it's it's so funny like but and I forget like I'm really kind of I guess desensitized in a way because like I have been doing it for about you know this December will be four years so three and a half years I've been doing it and um it's 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 got quite it's it's quite a big platform now like there's I think it's like eight six and a half thousand followers like and I lose the scale of that like I, I remember when I got like a thousand followers and I was like oh my god um and oh my god it's such an addict thing like now I'm like oh I don't have a hundred thousand it's not enough like but it's I lose the skill of that and lots of people do message saying like oh my god this helped me not feel alone today and and I, I really do forget like the actual 
necessity of I don't know, here am I like talking about the necessity of meetings in sobriety. Uh, also, like do your steps, connect with people, say like, trust God, share, like, clean house, their, mm-hmm. help others. Like, but... There is real work to be done outside <laughs> the memes, right? I mean, that's not. <laughs> Call your sponsor. Right. Um. <laughs> exactly. God. Um, but yeah, it's just, it, it is such a, um, you know, I think it says something, you know, it says we are not a glum lot. And that's for yeah. sure the truth because some of the stuff that you post is pretty dark and heavy yeah. and can be pretty like deeply depressing and you know when you touch on things like suicide that many people Mm -hmm. have come very close to and 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 understand and you make a joke about it like that is um like that says something about the community in which that is accepted is is that we have right we have been pretty damn close to some pretty dark spots and we have come far enough to be able to have a laugh at it because to think of, to look at it otherwise would be to just be miserable. Right. And I think, I think of this often that like, I've I've got a really core group of of friends here in, in London, which is where I live now. And, and I love them so much because we'll be talking about like, you know trying to kill ourselves and the whole every one of us in the circle just like yeah like nodding because like we all know how that feels and Mm. I mean that's why they're so precious to me because like they they have experienced something that a large amount of the population will never understand and uh that's so precious to me and yeah like I I sometimes forget like how dark I can get sometimes and uh every now and then like I know like some of my friends who aren't alcoholics like follow my memes and they're kind of like are you okay and I was like oh yeah yeah, I'm totally fine (laughs) like you know but it is the fact that like I will only I will only mean something if it's like in the rear view mirror because then there's like this perspective you know I, I went through in 20 20 late 2020 I went through like an enormous breakup like a really really horrible one that um you know it didn't become sobriety threatening but like you know it it was it it was bad and I knew that like I've got to keep this for me right now because I am not well in this arena so like like people like everyone should know that like if I'm posting dark shit that means I'm probably in a really good headspace because like I can kind of you know I can kind of carry that darkness and I think that's what it's all about it's about carrying the darkness because like that darkness is there and you know I think it's a Marianne Williamson um quote where she says like you don't cast darkness out by like hitting it with a baseball bat you just turn on the light so it's like sobriety is me just turning on the light like my dark parts maybe one day they will all be removed and I will you know be like Buddhist on a on a mountaintop to wear but like I that that darkness is there I've just learned to live with it I've just learned to love it I've learned to just accept it as part of me and it's just as lovable as the rest of me and and that's okay because we've been through a fucking lot man yes so maybe (laughs) one day it will be green juice and yoga and not uh but not quite yet you know maybe the maybe 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 it's in on the horizon I dread to think (laughs) but no, there's um, nothing wrong with green juice and yoga. I love a wee spot of yoga. I love a wee spot of green juice. Like, I'm, I'm just, I mean, maybe I don't, I, I don't know. I'm, but, I, it could be a thing. But we're still, today. we're still, uh, we're still uh, shedding light on the darkness. We're still shedding light on the darkness. You know, can't hit um, it with a baseball bat. No, I think, and I, you also mentioned something earlier. You guys must have the coolest uh, church basements in Scotland. <laughs> I'm just trying to imagine how much more. Oh, there's there's some quite beautiful ones. Not gonna yeah. lie, like, yeah. do you know, the thing? like, I was I was in uh, West End of town, uh, which is like a little bit posher, and I remember I was going past this really nice church, and I was like, oh, I bet there's a great meeting there. <laughs> like, like, that'd be a really nice one. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have great ones here, great meetings here, but um, but yeah, I just imagine those churches over there um historic well lauren thank you so much for this 
Oh, thank you. It's been great. It really, really, really awesome. appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. And um, I will uh, I will be looking for uh, brutal, brutally. What's it? Tell tell me one more time what it is. Brutal recovery. Thank you, brutal recovery. Yeah. Thank <laughs> brutal you. Sorry recovery. about that. I should. <laughs> <clears throat> we mentioned several in there. Brutal recovery. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, and I will Amazing. talk to you soon. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks again for listening. Our music, as always, is by Neglect. You can find more of his stuff at neglect.bandcamp.com. And you can find us on all social media platforms that matter, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And you can reach us at aisforalcoholic at gmail.com. Talk to you later. Yeah. <laughs>